Hello my friends and happy Friday to you. You've made it past this week. It's Friday so you're gonna have a party tonight, right? Because that's what most people do at Friday. You know what Putin did? He did address the air crisis in Russia. If you don't know then Russia has had a very tough time with eggs. Yes, chicken eggs in the past month. They have a huge shortage. If you ask me how a, such a huge country like Russia, which has huge fields for agricultural production and they have huge chicken farms also, how can they lack eggs? I don't know how, but they do. Egg prices have risen many times and people don't like it because eggs are one of the most vital part of Russian cuisine. Putin has addressed the issue and according to him the reason why there are no eggs for Russian people in the stores is because Russian people have been getting more money, the wages have increased in Russia, the living quality has increased, so people buy more food and they have bought all the eggs. So Putin is basically saying no, it's your fault because we pay you so much more money as a country, you have bought so much more food and we cannot keep up, so yeah. This is not a new thing to do. The Soviet Union did this all the time. There was lack of everything in the Soviet Union and every time the official explanation was that the living quality is so high that people are consuming all of this stuff and they're buying everything. In reality they didn't have the means to make anything. People know this, people remember this from the Soviet times and this rhetoric right here from the president is uh, very offending to the people who actually suffer because of it. And it really damages Putin's image in the eyes of the people. Putin is trying to fix it by importing eggs massively now from Turkey and Azerbaijan and now the first patch has dispatched. But there's an issue. 20% of the eggs from the first patch of imports of the Russian Federation from Turkey and Azerbaijan may be infected with bird flu, salmonella and botulism. A recommendation has been set out uh, to everyone who used these eggs to immediately donate their blood for uh, appropriate tests if they got sick or not. The entire batch of edible eggs, which was imported on January 3rd through the Yarak Kazmalyar checkpoint from Turkey in the amount of 19.36 tons, so 300,000 eggs, for further sale on the territory of Russia is subjected to seizure because it's possibly infected with salmonella or bird flu. So Russians are really not doing great with eggs. Now my friends, we watched a video brought to us by Dimitri, translated by him. Uh, Kamikaze hit a Russian, let's call it just a regular jeep. And this is the aftermath. We've been owned. A kamikaze hit us. And I'm surprised to see all of the men standing and walking around the vehicle because a kamikaze drone, small one, is still makes a, such a big of a bang that men are discombobulated. Or how do you say this word? I don't know. <laughs> they look flash banged and some of them are injured. Here the kamikaze hit us. <laughs> This is what these scum are doing, watch out. So you're uh, occupying another country's land, another people's land and you call them scum for defending themselves. This is beyond my understanding. Blad Kamikaze hit us, prick. Pro, turn the keys. Someone stop the ignition. If you know the Russian language then this is spicy. They are um, very spicy. Mm. Quiet. The gas cylinder was near your door. Would have been a proper blast. Look, look, the kamikaze. <laughs> See, bro. Look. And you can see the kamik... The whole car is screwed and you know what I actually want to point out, they're all walking around the car filming, doing stuff, breathing in and out and being like all panics around the car. The thing is, if you know these kamikaze videos, one goes in, there's another one ready right there and if there's a kamikaze drone, there is a recon drone up there watching everything you do. So if the first one didn't kill you, it killed the car, the second one will. So I don't know if those Russian troops don't know this, but there will be another hit, there will be another explosion in the area. I would run the hell out of there. My friends, Twitter account Clement Moline brings us a thread analyzing a Ukrainian defensive line. Now, it could be called the Ukrainian Surovikin line, uh, but actually it's the Donbass line. 
from 2014 to 2022 and even more recently in 2023, Ukraine has been building a huge defensive system. The multi-layer Donbass line composed of many trench networks, it's quite similar to Russian Surovikin line. When we talk of the defensive trench network, the huge Surovikin line is the first thing that comes to mind. Trenches, bunkers, mines, dragon's teeth. Well, I don't think the Ukrainians are employing dragon's teeth, because uh, honestly, seeing the Russian armored convoys attacking Ukrainian lines right now, they don't even reach close enough for dragon's teeth to be able to top stop them. Usually these... Uh, armored vehicles are destroyed before. Donbass line is quite different and more complex than the Russian Surovikin line. It is composed of highly defended fortified system separated by fields. If we take the example of Ukrainsk Muraka line facing south near Kurakova, we see that the Sentinel-2 imagery that each system is separated by a kilometer at least. Each fort can defend itself from every direction. You have to take all of them to advance. You can see these forts right here. This is a trench system, trench system, trench system. All of these fields, forts here, it's basically a kilometer of open field. So striking these forts is very difficult with infantry or armored vehicles. And if you take one, you have to take another one. And if you bypass and try to hit them from behind, you still have face the similar issue because it's fields on every side, plus they can defend from every side. So taking this network is extremely difficult with armored vehicles if you don't have air supremacy, which Russia doesn't have. Air is contested. Contrary to the Russian line, Ukrainian one is composed of many forts that are defending each other. The 2014 to 2015 Pop Popasla Luhansk line is a good example. To break through, you have to assure that no other fort has fire control on you. The Line Zero. This was the 2014 to 2022 line. It was composed of two systems near Mariupol, but it was overrun since it was undermanned. Let me remind you, Ukrainian armed forces and armed capabilities before Russian full-scale invasion of 2022 was, compared to now, extremely weak. Two lines near Papasna, Ukrainians retreated to the city, and one line between Marinka and Kharlivka. Some parts of the line are still standing. Now let's talk about Avdivka on that line, because Avdivka is not on that line. The line is 17 kilometers from Avdivka, behind Avdivka. So Ukrainians are not even fighting on that line. That is their um, retreatment line. How do you call it? If, if you're fighting and you're, the front is holding, but if you do need to retreat, you have an extremely well fortified place to retreat to. That is what that line is. And r Ukrainians are very efficiently holding the front right now. But they if they would have to retreat, they would retreat behind that line. But we all know the massive Russian losses in Avdivka. Imagine the losses if they would be charging against a well-fortified line built for 10 years almost. The final objective of the Russian offensive may be to reach Pokrovsk, the last city and industrial center of the Ukrainian Donbass, with Kramatorsk. The Ukrainian armed forces have built a two-layer trench system all around the city, and we can see it right here. Russians have done, unfortunately, the same for Melitopol and Tokmak and all of these southern occupied Ukrainian cities. Uh, taking them is going to be very, very difficult unless Ukraine gets big amounts of Western weaponry. And the same goes to this Ukrainian city. Pokrovsk uh, would be a city that Russia would have to op occupy if they want to occupy the whole of the Donbass region, which has been the goal for Putin for a long time, publicly announced goal. But I don't think they will ever take this city. So the front is standing. Ukraine is not attacking anywhere actively. They are actively defending and Russia is pushing. But the Ukrainians' defenses hold very strong right now. Why I tell this is that Ukrainians have not even retreated to their main defensive lines yet. They are holding a frontal areas right now and they are not stepping back at all. They're able to defend this front line which exists right now. But there is a well-fortified backup position. My friends, in Chechnya, the headquarters of the 70th Motorized Rifle Brigade were destroyed in a fire. There are many fires in Russia, uh, almost three, four times more in 2023 than there was in 2022. And I showed you the statistics a few videos ago. The thing is, these fires are not reported anymore by the West or by Russian media because they're so frequent. Nobody really reports them, nobody talks. But the thing is, if you burn down a factory, it burns with one night. You want to rebuild it, you build it for three years, two years. Let's take this 70th Motorized Rifle Brigade base that was uh, 
destroyed by a fire. Russia is currently experiencing a cold wave leading to more wildfires than usual. Why would a cold wave lead to wildfires like that? Well, because the cold, uh, most of the electrical and heating systems in any kind of Russian housing areas are 50 to 60 years old, half a century old. When cold and hot uh, change very frequently, materials behave strangely, expand and contract. Uh, if we talk about electrical infrastructure, that, it, that can generate sparks. If old wiring expands and contracts, there's moisture, con condensating water, sparks happen, wiring bursts into flames. It is all connected with the temperature changes. But in this particular case of the 70th Motorized Rifle Brigade in Chechnya, the theft statistics of that unit, I mean the entire Russian military, Ministry of Defense and the Russian army, it's all a huge theft system. Everybody steals before passing the gear on. But the gear and the money comes from above, they steal 10-20%. You get the 80%. You are the, let's say, a major. You steal 20%, you pass it on to the officers, all the ammunition, all of the vehicles, everything. You get your millions, you pass it down, they steal 20. So the front line only gets about 30, 40, maybe 20 sometimes percent of the entire capacity of the Russian Ministry of Defense. The rest of it, it's stolen. How is the theft covered up? Since most of the Russian data is still held in papers, don't ask me why, they have not modernized. Then the easiest way to cover it up is by burning the papers. So this is why we see so many military headquarters on fire because you burn it down, oh, it was an accident. Nobody asks questions because everybody is guilty of stealing. Nobody actually wants an investigation there. Not the top ones and not the low ones because all steal. So it burned down, the papers are gone. Oh, thank God, I'm never going to jail and I'm rich. So they build a new headquarters and start stealing again. It's, it's a never ending cycle. My friends, now I'll read you a thread from Chris O. Wiki, and the thread focuses on uh, criminals from the third world. Russia is seeking out, they're creating systems to import these criminals as meat to the front lines, because they need meat, and these criminals, they like money, and they want to get away from their home countries. Well, it's a win-win situation, I guess, for Russia and for the criminals. An increasing number of criminals and mercenaries from Africa are fighting with the Russian armed forces in Ukraine. In the latest instances, a convicted criminal from Cape Verde appeared in propaganda video and a Somali was captured by Ukrainian forces. The angry Chuvashia Telegram channel reports on a video circulated over the Christmas period by soldiers from Russia's Chuvash Republic in which they send greetings and victory messages from the Luhansk region to the city of Chuvashia. One of them is a man called Pina Nelson, a resident of the city of Cheboksare, who is originally from Cape Verde. He has reportedly been prosecuted 10 times for disorderly conduct, twice tried for theft, once each for a death threat, robbery and insulting a police officer. See, if a guy is convicted 10 times of this kind of behavior and then he goes into the military. What will happen? He suddenly becomes an angel and never behaves like that again. I mean, for a man, it's incredibly difficult to change its habits and behavior unless you're a very intelligent man and can actually focus down changing your habits. I don't think these guys can. So Russian army consists more and more of these kind of people who are convicted, who have these kind of issues or have fallen through the cracks of life. And an army is supposed to be connecting to people's minds with the words like discipline, uh, training, motivation. But this is not the case in the Russian army because it's filled in, in huge numbers with criminals actually, who have uh, impulsive control issues, let's say like that. And if you have, let's say 10,000 troops with habit of stealing, with no issues in resulting things with violence with their own friends and surroundings also within Russian army ranks, with impulsive control issues, they have weapons, Weapon, finger, trigger, impulsive control issues, you see where this is going. It's a disaster. And that's what's going on in the Russian army now. They can only be used as meat waves and this is what Putin is doing. Recently, who the rebels hijacked, they boarded and hijacked a whole tanker in the Red Sea. Now, the Red Sea is a very vital logistical transportation area for the United States, for European countries, for the whole world, actually. It's one of the arteries of the world's transportation, and the United States is guarding that area. They have an aircraft carrier in the area. Who these are Iranian-backed Shia Muslim group in Yemen, and they have the power there. They're called the Houthi rebels, and they're 
Why is it connected to Ukrainian war? Well, because they are Iranian-backed and Russia pays a huge amount of money to Iran, through which that money goes to the Houthi rebels who now attack the tankers. Now I'll read you a report from the United States. We attacked about 10 Houthi targets in Yemen, drone production centers and weapons warehouses were hit, a Pentagon representative said, confirming the attacks. Now this attack was done by a coalition of United States, United Kingdom, with the support of Netherlands, Bahrain, Australia, so it's a joint assault. This attack struck all Houthi held airports in Yemen and it was a, a magnificent fire show. It was a show of force by the United States and it was not only a show of force, it was uh, a very effective and efficient attack and, and a message to the Houthis and Iran also that we will escalate in the area if you continue taking the tankers or attacking the transportation. And the United States also proved with this that within minutes they are able to launch devastating attacks on who the hell territory. Now it is connected with the bigger picture because what now is a very popular expression, the global south, you know, Russia, Iran, North Korea, all of these countries that are against NATO and against the West, the other side, the global south, they're becoming more and more united. And as I just explained how the Russian money within the billions goes to Iran through that to who the rebels or to any militant groups that Iran is financing, and there are many, Russia is directly connected to the issues in the Middle East, to the issues in the Red Sea, and to, let, let's say, the Taiwan Strait, for example, which is one of the most important areas for the United States because of the chip production, microchips, which Taiwan is producing. Well, then North Korea. Russia is paying in insane amounts of money to North Korea. And North Korea has any kind of possibility and potential to ignite tensions in the Taiwanese Strait. So this is all connected. My friends, now for the last time in this week, I'll be butchering the Patreon names and if you want your name to be butchered in the most freakish way possible with my Estonian pronunciation, become a sergeant of the Arthur's army. Link is in the description below. Koilin Hill, Jeri Pole, Len Hobart, Nakho, Frapkin, Tod Hogart, Jot Trummert, Thank you to these people for supporting the channel. And until my next video, which will be on Monday, so the next week, I'll see you then, my friends. Slava Ukraini and bye-bye.